morning and welcome everybody. If everybody in the back would come on in, we are going to get started right now. Before we dive back into the introduction, we'll give everybody a second here. We'll have the uh, notes and the m and the maps and stuff up on the screen any second now. But before we dive in, let's have a, a brief prayer. Father, we're so thankful for today, a time when we can encourage each other and be encouraged by you and each other by your word. Uh, Lord, help us as we continue this study uh, that, we, that we will truly embrace the, the gravity of the things that you've revealed to us through inspired writers. Help us, Lord, to understand you better. Help us, Lord, to be more faithful and to love you more and to understand everything you've done for us so that we may uh, more willingly and lovingly surrender ourselves to you. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, is it up there? Okay, good. Just a quick recap of uh, what we were talking about. We are in an introduction of Philippians. And uh, just a sort of a quick rundown of a quick rundown of what the historical background of Philippians is, is that uh, it's named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip, uh, Philip II of Macedon. And, and so it historically was a place where he was, he was the self-proclaimed ruler of Macedonia, and he found a lot of gold in that area. And when he was assassinated in about 336, I think, B.C., uh, his, the army that he had amassed and the, the riches that he had amassed, they just went into the control of Alexander. And so that gives you an idea of, of the significance of the city in, um, in just world history as a whole. You fast forward about 300 years, and uh, this is where uh, Octavius in the Battle of, of Philippi is sort of springboarded into the first official Roman emperor, uh, Augustus Caesar. And so this city is significant in, in its function as a Roman colony, and by the time you get to the time of Christ and of the apostles and the gospel coming into it, it is... Um, it, it is primarily, as I, as I said before, it is like Florida of the Roman Empire. It's where all of the uh, retired veterans of the Roman military move. And so it's actually, it's the most Roman city that Paul probably, that he, uh, you might say that Rome is more Roman, but it may very well be that this is the most Roman. There, it seems as if there weren't even enough Jews to have a synagogue here. Uh, I don't know how much that has to do with, you know, the Jews, you remember Priscilla and Aquila were thrown out of Rome, and so maybe they were, they were pushing Rome, the, out of Roman strongholds, they were pushing out the Jews. I'm not sure exactly how those are connected. But apparently in this city, it's, it was primarily a bunch of Romans. But it was, it was a retirement community, which meant it was pretty nice. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it was, that doesn't mean that everybody who was there was well off. It still had the, the regular social structure. And that's one of the things that we were looking at as we, as we dove into not the historical background, but the textual background. What, what do we know about Philippi from Scripture? And in particular, what do we know about the gospel going there and about Philip's interaction with Philippi in the Philippians at, at his very first introduction to them. What, what happened there? And we looked into that some. As you can see here, the second missionary journey here in purple is right here. The green is the third missionary journey. And so it's the green, though, the green here is it's sort of a guess. Uh, the third missionary journey in Acts is a little more vague, and we're not exactly sure where all he went on third missionary journey. I believe it says something like he went to Greece for three years. And, of course, Greece is this whole thing essentially right today. But Macedonia is what we would call northern Greece, and Achaia is what we call southern Greece, where Corinth and Athens are. But you have, in the north, you have the cities like Philippi and Berea and places like that, Thessalonica, that we're very familiar with. And so as we look at the second missionary journey, he comes in, Actually, well, let's see here. 
It's a little bit closer view here. He has to, usually they cross the Aegean. They usually don't go all the way around. Um, but as you can see, it's right here on the list. In the second missionary journey, it's right there in the middle. And you find that in Acts 16. Now, not to reread all this, but remember at the end of Acts 15, he has a dispute with Barnabas about John Mark. And so Barnabas decides to take John Mark. And who does Paul take with him? Silas, it's up right here. He takes Silas with him. And so when you get to the beginning of Acts 16, he goes into Derby, Lystra, and he finds someone who is half Jewish, half Roman, and decides to take him with him. And who is that? He decides to take Timothy. And so now we're, we're forming a little posse here, right? And so uh, let's see here. What do I want to read here? And he's conveying to them everything that was decided at the... At the uh, Jerusalem Council in the previous chapter. That's what chapter 15 was about. And so you could think of the chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, as as far as the story goes, you have the first missionary journey, then you have the, the, uh, the Jerusalem Council, and then you have the second missionary journey. Of course, at the end of second missionary journey, he comes back to Jerusalem, um, and then to Antioch, and then he makes the circuit again. So, Paul likes to come back to Antioch as sort of like headquarters, but Jerusalem is also one of the places he finds himself going from time to time. Okay, so verse 6, Acts 16 and verse 6. It went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia because what? Do you remember what he, what he said he wanted to do here? Remember? Uh, that wasn't the right button. So I hope I didn't just shoot somebody in the eye with a laser. Okay. All right. Um, he says he wanted to go through Syria and Cilicia, strengthen the churches, uh, which assumes that what? If he's going to strengthen the churches, what does that assume about those places? What's that? Kind of, maybe that he's been there before, but it's not a really assumption. It's right there. There are already Christians there, already churches there. So it's likely that these are sort of some of the places they went on the first missionary journey, and so he wants to go back there. But when you get to verse 6, and went to the region of Phrygia and Galatia, which is where he was the first missionary journey, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Uh, and when he had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, let me go back just a little here so you can see this. Troas is right here, so it's in Asia Minor. Remember, see, you see the seven churches of Asia here? So he goes over to Troas when he's told not to go, uh, not to go into Asia. So he goes to here, and then that's when he receives the Macedonian call to come across over to here. So I, I, it's always helpful for me to be able to actually visualize where people are going and some people are not real friends with geography, and I encourage you to be friends with geography because it helps you understand stories better, because you can actually see it in your mind, where people are going and what they're doing. You're not good with geography? Go north two miles, and um, okay. See, that's Greek, right? Okay. All right, so... Verse 11, <clears throat> so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct uh, voyage to Samothrace and, and the uh, following day to Neapolis, from there to Philippi. So uh, Troas then to Samothrace, Neapolis, I believe Samothrace is an island, and then Neapolis is the coastal city. Philippi is just west, sort of uh, west, northwest from Neapolis, from the coast, and if you remember, the, the mountain ranges with all of the gold in them is just south of there. And that Philippi is sort of set in a little valley there where, where most of the traffic would, would be for the Roman Empire. And that's why, that's why the Ignatian Way or the Roman Interstate Highway goes straight through there. It's about a 500-mile stretch of road, which is, you can still see today. You can go and walk it today. Um, so they go for, to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. 
we remained in the city some days. Now, of course, if you've noticed the we, the plural, first person plural pronoun means that now Luke is with them. He, he, it seems that he met up with them somewhere in Asia, somewhere around where Paul is not being allowed to go into Asia, but is being, maybe he goes over to Troas, and then all of a sudden we have this we, so Luke is now with them, so it's Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. So now we have four, four people in this team. Verse 13. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we, were, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said what, uh, excuse, to, excuse me, to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed against us. Sounds like she strong-armed them to her house, all right? Um, kind of like, like Karen. Whenever someone's in need, she's like, you come to my house. That's a compliment. It's hospitality, right? Uh, Karen is a Lydia. So many others here are like that. Okay, a few things to draw from this, right? So they go into the city. Paul's normally going to go to the synagogue first, right? But it appears as if there's not even 10 Jews, which means there's no synagogue there. And so they go out to a creek, which some people can say you can actually still find this waterway today. And they find some people that they're praying. And you find Lydia, who is, reminds us of, at least reminds me of Cornelius, someone who was, was not a... Christian, not a Jew, but a believer and a fearer of God and prayed to God. And so Lydia is a lot like him, a lot like Cornelius. A third thing about her is that her occupation probably put her at sort of an upper class tier. Um, I remember thinking about uh, before I moved here, we had the we had the stock market crash in the end of 2008. And, uh, and I remember at the time that I was spending a lot of time in Biloxi, Mississippi. And, uh, and deep in, you might say, up inside the, the B- Biloxi Bay there, there were some people who built yachts, really nice boats. They were, they dealt in high-end stuff, all right? And I remember, and I can't tell you all the details now, but I remember how, thinking about how they sort of fit into the economy and that it's interesting to think that these are people who themselves are not necessarily upper, super upper class, but they deal with people who are super upper class. And, um, and so oftentimes when we think of luxury items, uh, those are typically those employee people who are not exactly upper class, right? Um, Lydia seems to sort of fit somewhere in there, that she, that she rubs elbows with the highfalutin people. And I, I talked to Kelly after this, and Kelly was like, he's like, you know what they, you know what they make that purple from? And I know I've read this somewhere, but he said it's squid ink. Now, the only real association I've ever had with squid ink is watching people drink shots of squid ink on Fear Factor. If you've ever watched that, I don't recommend it. Um, but it's this really nasty stuff, but, and it stains really bad. It's what squids release, you know, when there's a defensive mechanism, but apparently that's what they would dye stuff with. And this stuff was pretty rare. And so we have a, just a quick snapshot that Luke is giving us an ax of what this city is like. And here's one of the things that was suggested sort of as I was studying this was for us to pay attention in Acts 16, which is sort of, we're, we're thrown right into Philippi, to watch and look at the characters and look and see who they are. And look and see, because these are the people that Paul interacted with. Because this, the book of Acts is the Acts of what? It's kind of a trick question, but it's really an open-ended question. We like to say it's the Acts of the Apostles. Primarily, you could say it's the Acts of Peter and Paul, the Apostles Peter and Paul, even though there's mentioned others. 
Some people say this is, this is the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Some might say this is the acts of God in using his, the body of Christ, the church, to bring the gospel to the world. And so Acts is showing us how the gospel goes and the way it should go. What's natural? Yes, sir. Andy? It's sort of like a, the way you can think of Acts. I like the way you, you've... You mentioned that Acts is sort of like a documentary, but written down. Uh, you know, whenever you have like a, a documentarian that will go into like a war zone or something, and they start, and they start having the bullets whizzed by them, right? And they, they start using that first person plural pronoun, we. We were in the what, you know, that's Luke, Luke right now. He is there along for the ride, and he is seeing what's going on as the gospel is going forth into the world and what we're going to see in, well, in Acts, Acts 16 and 17 is that they're going to be described as doing what in particular? They have come and they have done what? Do you remember? It's kind of a general statement, but gives us an idea of what happens when the gospel comes into an area. Someone, anyone ahead of me? In the next, they turn the world upside down. That's going to be the accusation against them. Luke is showing us what that looks like. So first we have, he's going to someone who is at a, you might say this even dovetails nicely with, with James chapter 2. As we, look at, as we look at the characters here, it's going to dovetail nicely with James chapter 2, which is about partiality between the haves and the have-nots, so to speak. And, uh, of course, always being reminded that uh, Jesus, Jesus didn't have anywhere to lay his head. He was poor. All right. So, let's continue. Verse 16. Continue to notice the characters here. As we were going to the place of prayer, we uh, were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Okay, now who is this girl? And what else do we know about her? She is a what? You might say her occupation. She's a slave. Now what that meant, what that meant was in Roman Empire, I mean, this is the most Roman colony that Paul would be in, th this meant that she was property. She was property just like a plow. I think I, I mentioned something like uh, they, they had three, co three categories of, of property in the Roman Empire. They had, and I may, I, I may be botching this a little bit, but it's this idea. You have, uh, you have mute property. That means property that doesn't talk like a plow. Then you have uh, inarticulate property. That would be like a cow. It makes noise but doesn't talk. Then you have articulate property. Property that could talk. Isn't that a fascinating way of thinking about it? Okay, so this is a girl who was, of course she was demon-possessed, and she was being used by her, uh, by her owners to make a lot of money. But, but the real point is what? We have this shift from... As far as the people that Luke is spotlighting and what's happening with Paul is, we go from sort of an upper class now down to ministering to this bottom of the rung slave girl. And we don't know anything else after this. We don't know if she becomes a Christian or not. We're guessing that she does. A lot of things are implied in Scripture that would naturally follow. She's demon-possessed. You heal her, she becomes a disciple, right, of the one who healed her. And sometimes people would pow, bow down to Paul, and he would say, no, I'm just a man. Uh, it is by the power of Christ that this happened. Verse 19, the story continues. 
But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrate, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing the city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And of course, this is Paul and Silas. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Verse 29. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set, uh, set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Now, where does this character fit in and his family? We would think of military as what? Where do they fit in sort of as in their social status? We would think of them as middle class, so to speak. So we have, we have now, whether or not this is by guidance of the Holy Spirit or this is just incidental, we have Paul who first goes to the upper class and then he ends up going there right in proximity. There's no slave without an owner, right? So there's the slave owners. You have this upper class, and then there's lower class, and then he ends up ministering to and converting someone that we would call middle class. And one of the, the pictures that's painted by Luke, by, by Paul's interaction in Philippi, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and who else? Luke. By his interaction, we see a great snapshot of the gospel being for all for everyone and so this is the once and for all permanent record of the gospel going into this place that the gospel uh, as when we think of what is it going to look like when it goes into a place the way it should go into a place it's going to go everywhere yes sir You know, will we will we face that someday? Uh, will we will we face the idea of being thrown in prison for preaching the gospel? Uh, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news, but there there are quite a few preachers in Canada that have been thrown in jail this past year just for doing this, just this, what we're doing right now, just nothing crazy, just what we're doing. And I think they're still not allowed to do what we're doing. And may be thrown into prison if they do. It, it gives us pause, really, to think about whether or not we, we, over the past year, were we trying to make the best decisions? Yeah, but have we, have we been... let's say, too compliant to those who say, no, you can't do what God wants you to do. God wants us to do something. It is the right thing to live a quiet and peaceable life and submit to the government as long as it is submitting to God. And yet there are people who, and that's the thing is, if, if, we, if our government were making different decisions, would we be here today risking imprisonment? like some people who are just a few hundred miles north of us. 
I mean, I have a friend, I may have told you, I had a friend who the, the, the cops busted into his congregation. I think he lives in New Brunswick. And he didn't haul him off to jail, but they shut him down. Just for doing this. Just for doing this. Now, Canada is not exactly like we are, but Canada, Canada can give us an idea of what is becoming acceptable within a society more than, say, south of the border. They're much more aligned with us culturally. What happens there is, as far as the cultural shift, is, gives us an idea of what's going to happen here. It's sort of a, a window into the future. So, good question. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. We, we have a, a very special uh, experiment. The American experiment is very special. One of the things primarily enshrined in it is, is, a, is a right to conscience, a freedom of conscience, that the government can never tell us to do something that goes against our conscience. I mean, that, that's... That's built into the foundation of, of who we are. So it is terrifying when people who get into power say, you know what, the things that are conscience issues for you, you're going to need to change those things. Those are people who don't have any idea how, what this country, the ideals of the founding of the country. And they don't have, like these people, they don't have any clue about, well, let me say it quite simply, they don't have fear of God. They, they are not in touch with reality. And so the more that becomes common, the more that we are going to be under threat. Just like Paul. You know, a couple years ago, if I'd have read this, we'd have all thought, oh, man, maybe in 50 years, right? But there's a reason why we talk about these things. Because when the moment comes, we've got to be able to say, prison, oh, okay, okay. If I can't say it now, because, look, at the time when it happens, and it may just be a matter of when, when it happens, what are you going to do? There, there's so much of our of our uh, Christian lifestyles in the the typical Christian lifestyle today that is just a, a a Christianity of convenience. And as soon as it becomes inconvenient, and then even to the extreme that it would be something that you would incriminate you, then how many people who claim to be Christians are just going to throw that in the trash? No, I'm just going to. You know, they're going to take that passage out of the context that we looked at recently, where two or three are gathered together, they're gathered in my name. We'll just stay at home and we won't risk imprisonment. That's not what that passage means. And so if, if, our, if our Christianity is a, is a Christianity that is something we do in its convenience for us in our lifestyle, and that's what it is, it's very, very likely that as soon as push comes to shove, we'll just reject it. So Paul sets a great example here of non-compromising. Non now, earlier in the book of Acts, we have the same thing in Jerusalem. But now he's just meeting new people with the same old, the same old tale. No, you can't come and do that here. And so most countries in the world were not founded with the ideal that we were founded with of freedom of conscience. And so uh, you go to many, many countries in the world, and they'll tell you, no, that religion is not, they're not accepted here. Uh, Islam isn't accepted in Japan, do you know that? Because they know that Islam is, by its very nature, subversive to government. They won't let it in. Yes, sir, Kelly. Yeah, if you don't know about the Uyghur genocide in China, just look it up. Google may not help you with it because they're in compliance with China. Google is helping China. But there, there, are, there are places where it's, it's literal genocide. They're rounding them up, putting them in camps, and they just disappearing them in China. And uh, they're, they're doing that. Right now they're doing that with Muslims in China, but they're also, there's not to the same extreme, but they're also doing that with Christians in China as well. 
You, you have to be very, very careful in China because you can really get in trouble with the government. And so, but they don't stop. At least the faithful ones don't. The faithful ones still meet. Just like the first century did, they may have had to meet, you know, before sunrise in private uh, so that they wouldn't all just be killed every Sunday. But they were still faithful to it. They risked that. All right, let's continue here. Verse 35. But when it was day, this is, so we have Philippian jailer's family is baptized. They become Christians. When it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Now, this is interesting. Paul doesn't just take it lying down. He's, Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? He says they've done something illegal by Roman law. No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So here's the question for you. This is a, this is a question that maybe makes a lot of Christians squirm. When the government breaks its own laws against Christians, what is the example that we find in Acts? Just lie, just, just lie down, roll over? Just comply? Because we're supposed to just comply? We're supposed to just submit to God? Whatever they say is the law at the moment. What we find with Paul is he's, he holds their feet to the fire and he says, what you've done is illegal. You can't do this to me. And I see many Christians who say, well, Christians, we can't, we can't defend our rights under law. Who are we to do that? Paul, well, Paul did it. Yes, sir, Andy. Well, it, they didn't have a choice. They had a choice not to, not to preach. Yes, sir. Um, well, see, and that, that's part of the law was is that they had, they're supposed to verify that ahead of time. They just jumped the gun on them because they didn't like what was going on. And so they did something illegal right, out, right off the bat. So if, you know, if, if our government all of a sudden starts to do everything that's contrary to what the Constitution says, do we just say, well, I'm just doing what the government told me to do? Well, what did Paul do? Paul said, wait, 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 they're trying to worm their way out of this, and they've treated me illegally here. Hold, them, hold, hold their feet to the fire. Now, does that mean we need to start suing the federal government? I don't know what the right answer is. But what I'm saying is, is that there's precedent by Holy Spirit-inspired apostles of defending their rights under law against an imperial government. We aren't in the Roman Empire. We have, the government has recognized inalienable rights. They recognize God. The government doesn't give us rights. So what's our proper function when the government begins to say, you can't do what Christians do? Not only, like Paul did, should we make the choice to do it, but then also to defend our right under law to do it. That's, what, that's the example that we have. That's not subversive. That's not subversive. When we are asking the government to uphold law, uphold the Constitution, that's not subversive. And just, just chew on that. Just let that simmer. Asking the government to abide by their own law is not subversive to government. By the example of Paul right here. That's the end of chapter 16. They go out of town and they go to Thessalonica. The Thessalonican uh, Jews run them out. They, they go to Berea, run them out of there as well. 
course, he goes down to Athens. That's where he preaches at Mars Hill. That's chapter 17. But this is an introduction to the letter of Paul to the Philippians. This is his first interaction with that group there. That he met there and was there not very long. And there were people who became Christians there. And so now as he writes, let's think about the setting of his writing. What is he doing when he's writing? Philippians 1.7, 1, 1, 1.12, and 13, and 1.17 show us that he's in prison. And of course, this is granted that he's, it's a prison epistle, but uh, these are the indicators. Uh, it is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the, the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So his imprisonment there, verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Verse 17, the former persecute Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. And so Paul is showing clearly that he's in, in prison. There are a couple of options there are a couple of options for where he is in prison. Who can tell me what those options are? A couple of main, like, top-shelf options. Where is he in prison right now? He's probably in Rome there for two years. Where was he also in prison at one time? Just before he got to Rome. He was somewhere else for two years. He was in Caesarea, right? Um, but there's, there are a couple of problems with, there's a couple of problems with this, Okay. In the book of Philippians, he's talking about his possible impending death. Now, if you get the death sentence as a Roman citizen, you have the right to do what? Appeal to Caesar, right? But if you're already in Rome, then that means you've already appealed to Caesar, right? So the letter that he's writing to them, talking about how he may die, it looks, it looks as if that, that is still an option because... The appealing to Caesar option isn't on the table like it was in Caesarea. Uh, also, if you remember, in when he's in Jerusalem, not in Caesarea, but when he's in Jerusalem before they take him to Caesarea, you remember what happens in Acts 23 and verse 10? When the dissension became violent, this is when, when he was riling up the Jews and the Romans were protecting him. It says, when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces, the tribune is the, is the Roman in charge, torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord, Jesus, stood by him and said, Take courage, for, you, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So it wouldn't make sense for Paul to be in Caesarea writing about his impending death when he just received within depending on how many months ago it was, he just had Jesus standing next to him saying, oh no, you're going to get to Rome. There was no reason for him to have, have this um, suspicion that maybe his life would end soon because he had this assurance by Jesus that no, you're going to make it okay, at least to Rome. So these are things that would make us uh, have the idea that he's definitely in Rome when he's writing this, even though some people like, still like to debate this. Also, in Philippians 1, 12 and 13, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. The term there is praetorium, the imperial guard, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, you could say that the imperial guard could be anywhere within the empire, sure, but it's likely that this is pointing to him being in Rome. And then in chapter 4, verse 22, Paul says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And this really kind of puts the nail in the, uh, any doubt of where he is. I don't think Caesar's household is hanging out in Caesarea or anywhere else, really. And so it wouldn't make sense for him to send greetings from the household of Caesar from a place where the household of Caesar doesn't live. So this is just giving us some, this is looking at some indicators within the letter itself to giving us a, a really full and robust background of this thing. I will just end with this quick overview. 
this is, these are the main ideas that I wrote down. These are the main ideas that I wrote down just when I was reading through, read through the four, the four chapters. It, doesn't, it just takes a few minutes. I encourage you to do it, to read it down and to do this. Write down the main points or ideas per, per chapter or by paragraph. And it's very simple, actually. Chapter 1, Paul's, this is my takeaway. And this isn't the only point of, the, of a particular chapter, but it's one of the main points, you might say. Paul's imprisonment, this is what he's saying here in chapter 1, that his imprisonment has been for the benefit of the church and the furthering of the gospel. Chapter 2, Jesus sets the example for the servant mind we should have towards others, Epaphroditus exemplifying this mindset. Chapter 3, as citizens of heaven, we must sever ourselves from anything that jeopardizes our citizenship. In chapter 4, God empowers a life of contentment in all circumstances. So these are things that he is writing from prison, thinking that his life may end. I encourage you to read through that. Our time is up. Does anybody have any questions or comments about any of this? Let's have a quick prayer and we'll be dismissed for a few minutes. Our Father, you, you are better to us than we deserve. Your grace and your love and your mercy, your kindness, your gentleness, your patience with us, Lord, we don't deserve any of it. We're thankful that you are our God, our Father, and we're your children. Help us, Lord, every day to, to embrace the empowerment of that reality. As every day we trust you more and more. Thank you for a time together where we can encourage each other of those truths and lift you up as our God and Savior. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.